Greetings, everybody, and it's good to be back with you again. Yeah, so tonight what we're going to do is uh, move into models of government. Uh, what I want to do is just begin with looking at briefly, again, uh, what we've seen thus far. And the purpose of this is, again, uh, people tend to um, think of just, you know, one-liners or a few verses. What I'm trying to do is give some kind of framework to understand the biblical revelation about uh, justice and, and the mission of the people of God. And so we began with the image of God, which is just to say that every human is worth and potential. But what we have with the fall is humanity aspiring to be like God, which will trigger uh, death uh, in the world. And we actually worked that out as we walked through the following chapters in Genesis about Cain kills Abel, uh, Lamech is boasting about how many people he's killed and, and how many people he'll wound. Uh, in chapter five, everyone is dying in the flood, everybody dies. It's just, it's just a narrative of death. In the midst of that narrative, you'll find some individuals that become the hope of the world whether that would be Seth or whether it be Noah. Um, and then when you get to chapter 11, you have all of humanity kind of raising their fist against God and, and trying to build a tower that reaches to the heavens. And so it's, it's not only each one of us has these aspirations um, and ambitions uh, to be like God, which plays itself out in our relationships in our workplace, but you also have it corporately. So you see it with groups of people, you see it in human government, uh, all the ways that humans try to be better than the other person or the other group. This, of course, would be a, a breeding ground for racism, um, for different class systems, and the idea that if you're in a certain class, you're better than the class under you. All these kinds of things are very linked into the beginning of, of, of the Bible. <clears throat> and so what we saw was... What you have then is the call to mission in a, in a world of death, and this is to be a blessing to the world. And what we saw was that the blessing is both physical, it's water, it's children, it's food, it's flocks, uh, it's general well-being, but it's also relationship with God. And what you find in the narratives of Genesis is the, the patriarchs proclaiming um, their faith in Yahweh, uh, building altars uh, and telling people that this has all come from him. At the same time, you'll see them fail miserably and sin horrendously. But through the midst of it all, God works with his people. And we see how this plays itself out individually in terms of family, and then in Joseph, of course, at a national level. So you see the, the, these concepts of blessing interacting with the faithfulness of the people of God and their testimony uh, to the world. And then we talked a little bit about the next piece of the narrative, which would be Exodus and the coming of the law. And what I tried to do with the law, because most people have a bad idea what the law is and what it was designed to do. But we see that it's born uh, with an Exodus people, an oppressed people. And God hears their cry. And this is in chapter two. And he, he takes them out of Egypt and he puts them in, uh, in, in the desert and there he'll give them an alternative law system. A, 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 it's a blueprint for an alternative culture, which would be in contradistinction to where they've just come from, which would be Egypt. So they'll have different concept of family. They'll have different concept of how to treat workers and the poor and the stranger. So you have this uh, alternative worldview coming into play, deeply religious. And so it'll be full of festivals and sacrifices and other religious activities, which you would expect in that kind of culture. But again, what you're seeing is the law is not primarily about sacrifice for sin, but establishing an alternative uh, society that will be deeply religious. And even, even the laws and the feasts are, are designed to help them remember uh, where they came from and why they got the law and what is its purpose. Uh, to be gracious to those among them and to be a light to the nations. This is Deuteronomy 4, uh, where you see this passage in verses 6 to 8. 
Now, what we did last time was to move from the idea of law to the idea of government. And what I tried to do last time was to say that in the Old Testament, you don't have one model of governance. Uh, you begin with families, this is in, in Genesis, and then uh, you move into kind of a tribal structure as these families have grown. These would be uh, the sons and descendants of Jacob. So now you move into a tribal structure and you see this um, in, in Ruth, you see this in, in the book of Judges, for instance, uh, and then even in the beginning of 1 Samuel. Uh, and then out of the tribal uh, groups, uh, you'll see the, the rise of a king, and this will be uh, Saul and then David. Now, what we saw last time uh, was that in this movement from tribe uh, to, to monarchy, um, they're looking for justice, they're looking for peace and protection, and this is a common theme in the ancient world and today. And so even in 1 Samuel 8, when they are complaining about the need to have a king like everybody else, these are the two issues. The issue of, of uh, justice, because uh, Samuel's sons are corrupt and they're not judging properly, and also the idea of someone to protect them and to lead them into battle. And this will actually be mentioned in 1 Samuel uh, 8, where God will warn them about what governments will do and what we saw was if we look at the text, the word that keeps coming up over and over and over in 1 Samuel 8 is the idea of, of government taking, taking their young people and, and young men and putting them into the armies, taking the young women and putting them to work in the national palace. They will take uh, taxes, they will take the land and they will take these things and then the king will give it to um, his confidants uh, and his family. And so these kinds of corrupt activities are kind of inherent, even in, in the monarchy uh, in ancient Israel. And God warns them that you want a king, I've been your king, but you want a human king, and I'll give it to you, but just be warned, this is what you will have. And then we looked at, um, you know, the passage in Deuteronomy 17. And I was saying that this was the anti-ideology, because... In the ancient world, a king would be great if he had uh, big armies, this would show his power. Uh, if he were rich, this would show uh, his wealth and his status. And if he had uh, women, and therefore a lot of children, and this would have shown him to be very virile, right? And so this would have been the hallmarks of, of a great king. And God says, the king that I want you to have should do none of these things. And so what you're seeing is these human models, because the monarchy is all they know in the ancient world. But at the same time, God's ideal uh, for governance actually moves in a separate direction. Now, as you we were talking about that last time, uh, what happened was this idea uh, or the question, okay, so what do we do with that today? Because today we don't, I mean, there's still some monarchies at some level in the world where we see this in in Britain, right, uh, with Charles, the king. But it's more of a figurehead. It's a kind of a, a democratic monarchy where uh, he really has no power. Uh, and you see this in other countries uh, in Europe as well. And you'll have some kings in the Middle East uh, and in some tribal groups in, in uh, Africa, things like this. Um, but it's not like you would have found in the ancient world. So how do we, in the modern world, begin to move from the biblical portraits and the biblical mandates uh, to, to modern government. And so what I thought I would do is to begin just to talk tonight about the political models that the church has historically developed. Now, what's gonna be frustrating is that each of these models um, um, has its own history, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, and its own adherence, and a lot of it will depend on your uh, theological choices and your denominational affiliation. And most people don't recognize this, but that's, that's, that's the fact. So I can't say there's one model uh, that would 
define how Christians and the church are to relate to human government. Because actually, historically, there's been several Christian models, and these actually have been multiplied uh, even in, in the last hundred years. So what we find is that each of these models is rooted in a particular history. If we go back to the early centuries of the Christian church, uh, Constantine, uh, you may know these uh, kind of ideas and stories, but Constantine will convert to the Christian faith and he'll try to impose uh, the Christian faith uh, to, to the Roman Empire. And so this idea of, of Christian faith and uh, coming together, uh, even with empire, has a very long history, and this would have been true uh, by the fourth century AD. But you can see how this, uh, in many ways, for instance, is rooted in the Reformation. So you have Luther, who will uh, be declared a heretic by Rome, and uh, Rome will excommunicate him, and there will be some that actually will try to kill him. And so what he'll do is he'll seek the protection of the princes. Uh, and that would explain, if you understand how Germany was, or that area of the world was organized, it was regional princes. And so he will have a protector of prince. And this undoubtedly would kind of help frame his view of, of government, especially government vis-a-vis -vis religion, because he's, uh, you know, the Reformation out of the Catholic Church and the role of the Catholic Church in politics in Europe at the time, and how this will explain, as I will show you a bit later, this idea of the two kingdoms. If you look at Calvin, uh, he's involved in the Reformation as well, but he will go to Geneva and set up uh, a Christian city-state. Now, it's a very different kind of theology, but he will try to set up a very Christian type of government in a particular city. And that model uh, in Geneva will move its way into, the, into England and to Scotland and into the Netherlands. Uh, the Anabaptists, in this time of, of Reformation, there's a group that will call for believers baptism. That's why it's Anabaptist, a second baptism. And um, they are very persecuted, persecuted uh, by the Reformed tradition, uh, let alone the Catholic tradition, and even uh, killed, persecuted, and executed uh, by people of the Reformed tradition. And so that will trigger a certain way of looking at the state and looking at the Christian faith and the role of the Christian community in society. If you move into the modern world in the last hundred years, and, you know, Herb, you know, you would know more about this, of course, than I would. Uh, the Black Church, which is a very particular kind of history, and its view of government is very much grounded in its experience in this country vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the U.S. government uh, before the Civil War and after the Civil War, uh, Reconstruction, and then afterwards, uh, segregation. And so you have a very different understanding of how to relate to the government than you, you might have if you were in, in, a, in an Anglo denomination. Um, I haven't mentioned the Roman Catholic Church. It is centuries of social thought and the role of the Catholic Church in society. In this country, the Catholic Church was a minority uh, religion in an immigrant religion that would come with some of the Germans, but also especially with the Italians and, and the Irish, and now with the Latin Americans. But it's always been uh, a marginal kind of Christian faith in this country. And so they've acted like that. But if you go to Catholic social thought uh, and you have Catholic societies like you would have had in Latin America, the church functioned in different ways. And in the last 30, 40 years, uh, 50 years actually now, you could talk about liberation theology coming out of uh, Catholic Latin America. So you have all these different models floating out there. So the question is, uh, which one do we choose? And I really can't give you any particular one to choose, but I can kind of talk to you about uh, their different uh, foundational beliefs that give rise to their particular model. And then uh, we can have that discussion maybe talk about what might be uh, the best. The other thing is that no model is monolithic. And what I, what I mean by that is, even if you talk about the reform tradition, 
And there's going to be a spectrum of views within the Reformed tradition. Uh, the same would be among the Anabaptists, uh, the same among the Lutherans, and of course, Roman Catholic, uh, you have official Roman Catholic social thought, but you also have varieties. All you would have to do would be to compare, for instance, John Paul II and Pope Benedict with uh, what uh, Pope Francis is doing. You know, very different personalities and very different agendas. So even though there's a tradition of papal encyclicals and uh, uh, official social thought within that, those thoughts, uh, there are different models and different ways of engagement. So what I want to do is give you these various views. And what I want to do is uh, I'm going to just give you a few of the models, and I'm going to begin with those who advocate for less direct involvement in society and in government and move to those who would uh, advocate, advocate more, more involvement uh, as individual Christians as well as, as the Christian church. I've already mentioned that the Anabaptists uh, have a particular history, uh, and they begin as a persecuted minority within the Reformed tradition and uh, coming also uh, in Germany, in parts of Germany, so the Lutheran. So they, you know, Lutherans will do infant baptism, for instance, as does the Reformed tradition. And these were the Anabaptists, as I mentioned. This would be the second baptism, believer's baptism. And this was considered heresy. Um, what you have, too, is kind of a, a rejection of kind of the organized church, which you would also have among Lutherans and uh, in Calvin and in Geneva, very structured kind of uh, Christian hierarchies. And so what you have are these, are these communities, uh, very self-consciously different than the other Christian communities, and they will suffer for it. And so oftentimes, if you look back at uh, the Anabaptist tradition, they've been more concerned about how they are different and how they don't engage the government. And I'll talk about that in a moment. And, and that's it, at the beginning, kind of a survival mode, actually. Um, versus, let's say, a very well thought out and elaborate reformed political theology. See, so where it, it's just a different context and, and different um, realities that are driving the thinking of, of both of those. Now, when I say Anabaptists, you know, what comes to mind would be the Mennonites, for instance, would be, and there's a different kinds of Mennonites. And maybe the most uh, extreme that most of us would have some idea about would be the Amish, for instance. So that would be one kind of, of a super Anabaptist. But you won't find, uh, you know, you've got some, you've got some Anabaptist. Um, John Howard Yoder would have been would have been one. Um, he had issues uh, of sin, as, as some of you might know. But you, you wouldn't find tomes of Anabaptist political theology like you find with the others. And what is central to their view is the life of Jesus. Now, this is where it's going to be different, because oftentimes in the Reformed or the Lutheran position, it's very much about the cross. That's the point about the life of Jesus. Now, the Anabaptists won't disagree with that, but what they will say is the thing that you're ignoring is the life of Jesus. And so if we are to be followers of Jesus, his lifestyle becomes the thing that we're supposed to imitate. Not just the cross, but the daily life of Jesus. This is how we become true followers of Jesus. And this makes them very distinct. But this will also drive... Uh, the kind of political ideas that they have. Because, for instance, if you're looking at the life of Jesus, is he involved in government? No. Uh, is he encouraging his disciples to be involved in government? Well, the answer is no. Uh, what you see him is creating a community of disciples and trying to, to, uh, to mentor them and to shape them. And this is where they would go. To the life of Jesus, not just the cross of Jesus. 
And what you do then is if you're focusing on the life of Jesus and the followers as being uh, imitators of Jesus, the, the central idea is how do we create a very distinct community of Jesus followers? And this community is a community of virtue or the virtues, so the virtues of peace and justice, for instance, of truth-telling. This would be uh, their conviction. Now, what you're seeing is the focus is kind of inward. The idea of being an alternative community to everything around them. And the idea is, if you were to somehow consider or to contemplate that the world can be that, that would be a delusion. If you want to believe that the world will actually accept you as the alternative community, just look at the life of Jesus. That's not going to happen. And you should expect to be marginalized and even to suffer as this community, uh, which we call the church. And so the idea is not the church engaged in politics, but the, that the church itself is a politics see, in the sense that you know, what does the community look like and how does it function within the world becomes the talking point. So what that will mean with that focus on being an alternative community is that you, you consciously decide that you are going to be distinct from the public square. And so uh, we are different, and these are the reasons why we're different, and the world is the world, and we have no illusion of, uh, of getting actually sucked into the world. Because the idea is, if you get over-involved in the world, uh, you will lose your distinctiveness, and the church will no longer be an alternative community. It will actually begin to mirror the culture within which it, it resides. So... It doesn't mean you're not concerned about these things. I mean, you can get involved as, as local Christians and, and local churches, and you can speak up about things. But there is this distinction about you and the culture around you and, and, the, and the government. And therefore, uh, again, following Jesus, there is this choice for nonviolence. Uh, because if you're not going to engage the world, as directly as some of the other models, and you would expect the world to uh, reject you, then the question is, well, how do you respond? And this is where they will opt for nonviolence. So nonviolence also is on a spectrum uh, because this will raise questions of self-defense, for instance. Um, and some would be pure pacifists that would not even uh, try to defend themselves. So this is the Anabaptist model. If we move to the second model, this would be the Lutheran model. And um, this is going to be key. This first point is what differentiates them from the Reformed tradition. If you're looking at when does government actually come into existence, what they will do is they will look at Genesis 9, 5 to 6. This will be post-fall, post-flood, where it says if if, uh, if someone sheds the blood of another human, their blood shall be shed. And this becomes foundational because the idea is that governments are designed to control human violence. Okay, So what you're seeing is government kind of from the very beginning has a kind of a bit of a negative role. And the idea is uh, it's an, what they would call an emergency order post-fall, something needs to control human violence. And one day, human government will disappear. So it's an interim between the fall and the flood and the coming of Jesus. It's in this in-between time. And so it has a primarily a negative role to kind of control human society. Now, what that means then is that you would believe in the sovereignty of God, but this is where they get the idea of the two kingdoms. God rules over the kingdom 
represented within the church in one way, and God engages the nations and the world in another way. Now, he's ruler over both, but he will rule over them differently. His expectations of the church and his king and the kingdom, uh, his kingdom within his people, and the uh, the uh, his rule and sovereignty and ways of, of acting and moving and judging the nations is different. Now, in its worst manifestations, and each of these have both good examples and bad examples. The easy one about Luther and things that people would know is that there were some in Nazi Germany, Lutherans, who appealed to the two kingdoms, you see, where the idea was that the government does one thing and the church does another thing and they don't engage. Some had, had sold out to the Nazi ideology, but the idea is that they were actually two separate kingdoms. See? So that was kind of a natural move potentially, but in, in a perverse way where you don't get involved in running the government. Um, and of course, uh, what was called the German church was co-opted by the Nazi ideology. But this is the idea, the two kingdoms. And so if the church is not engaged directly in uh, government, um, what is the church to do vis-a-vis -vis the government? And the idea is to encourage what they would call Christian vocations. So Christians can work within the government and other local kinds of things, but it's, it's not being done as a church, but being, by, being done by individual Christians who have Christian witness in, in all these different positions, but it is not the church itself inserting itself uh, in, in, into, uh, into government. And this is why the church can speak out. It can uh, try to be at the conscience of, of, a, of a nation, um, but involvement is limited to individual Christians. And now you can see this is very different than the Anabaptist model. It's different because uh, the idea of, of Christian vocation is very different. The idea of what the role of the church is in the public square is very different. Uh, and even the idea of the two kingdoms is a bit different uh, because there still is the, the possibility of, of those kind of engaging in ways that an Anabaptist uh, would, not, would not want to look at. But, uh, the idea of, of the government being uh, post-fall and kind of negative, uh, that would resonate with the Anabaptists. So we've moved from kind of no involvement to individual vocational involvement, okay? So let me stop here for a second because I'm giving you a lot of information, but you're seeing that each of them are going to appeal to the Bible. And you can see, just listening to their theologies, that each of them makes sense. If they did not make sense theologically and biblically, they wouldn't exist, you see, but they do exist. So the question becomes, again, how are you going to frame your biblical discussion and what are you going to be your theological choices? And that's the Reformed tradition. Now, this goes all the way back in this country to the Puritans, very Reformed. Um, and part of it, you even had, you know, the English Revolution, which would have been in the 1600s, um, where there was a time uh, where this Puritan mentality actually uh, was in control uh, of the government. And this would have been Oliver Cromwell, and um, put all kinds of reforms in place. And we'll, we'll see some of the tendencies that sometimes are not good. But look how different this is than the, the uh, Anabaptists and the Lutheran, where you're going to locate the government in creation. So government does not begin uh, post-fall, post-flood, but the idea is that you locate the government within the created order itself. Now, what do I mean by that? Is that they'll connect it to what's called a cultural mandate. And there's a logic to this, you see, where we're called to, to rule and subdue the earth. They would say that that's what government does. And so government has its roots back in Genesis 1. 
and therefore you don't need to have the inherently negative view of government that the other options that we've looked at have. In fact, uh, because of the cultural mandate, we are, have the responsibility to engage the government and to be involved in the government. Okay. And because the cultural mandate ideally is for all humanity, not just believers, uh, all humanity has the obligation to move toward God's ideals for government. So if you begin with more of an optimistic view of human government, and the idea that government actually is part of, of the mission of humanity, but also the particular mission of the people of God, this will actually move you into much more involvement uh, with government. And so it's a very different mentality. It's more optimistic uh, and more involved very self-consciously. And what is key is what they would call the arc of redemption, right? So uh, the key is this, that, that Jesus in his resurrection is now Lord over everything. You can see how you can, you can go through the epistles, for instance, for this kind of idea. And so if he is Lord over everything, that means he's also Lord over human government. And therefore, it is the responsibility of Christians and the church at, at, at some level to be involved in, in government um, because it should come under the lordship of Jesus. So now you begin to look for uh, Christianizing the government. Uh, this is not only done by putting Christians in government. That would be the Lutherans would be happy with that but also establishing laws that would be Christian and trying to establish a Christian nation. Now, with the other two models, the, the possibility of having a Christian nation would be impossible, you see, um, because only the church has been redeemed. And if you think that you can redeem a fallen government, in a fallen world, uh, that just is not going to happen. Whereas the reformed people would say, no, Jesus is Lord. And so it is my obligation. It's our obligation to move, to move in to involvements, to Christianize uh, the nation. So when you, as I mentioned, uh, the Puritans, they come, they had the idea of establishing a, a Christian colony. And actually, in the first generation, to even be involved in local government, you had to be a confessing believer of the reformed kind. <laughs> uh, and those who didn't agree, like Roger Williams, who would be one of the early Baptists, you know, he has to leave Massachusetts. And he'll go to Rhode Island and, and found another colony that has its roots, uh, not in the reformed tradition, but is, is, it's, it's following a Baptistic model. So if you look at, uh, at this country, um, you can begin to see how this could play itself out for good or for bad about Christianizing this country, uh, where others would think it's impossible and really we shouldn't be doing it, uh, for the reform tradition actually becomes a mandate. Now in its worst uh, iterations, um, in a perverse kind of way, just like the Lutherans, a, a perverse Lutheran would have been the, the Nazi regime in this country it would be uh, Christian nationalism. Um, see, where again, you're gonna to try to make a Christian nation and, and you, you'll do it by force if necessary. Again, this is kind of a perversion of the reform model, but you can see how this would kind of be a, a possible logical consequence uh, of this kind of thinking. And one of the things that's key uh, to this uh, reform tradition is what they call sphere sovereignty. And what that means is this, if you go to, to Genesis one and the cultural mandate and the idea of, of uh, ruling and subduing the earth, 
this will happen differently in different spheres. So within the family, it, it'll function one way. In education, it'll function another way. In politics, it'll function another way. In the arts, it'll function another way. And each of these are separate spheres. And so the idea is that these are actually different and separated. And we get into trouble if we try to somehow mix it all together. But this is one of the, uh, I think the, the good fruits of, of the reform tradition. If you believe that God has mandated us to be involved in government, you're also to be involved in culture. So the reform tradition will have kind of a theology of the arts, uh, a theology of politics, uh, but a theology of education, you see, because the idea is, is that we're supposed to be involved in all of it, and you see them developing theologies in each of those different spheres. Uh, so you can see how this would be a positive thing, uh, but it fits into their model. Okay. Are there any questions about, because this is a very prevalent model in, in a lot of evangelicalism, as you can imagine, this more reformed tradition. And for a lot of people, you get a mix of this Anabaptist and Reformed. Um, kind of like what you were saying, you know, uh, Herb, where they want this to be a Christian country and we should be involved and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, they, they, they don't want to, you know, talk about it. Kind of. right. So you're seeing this mix of Anabaptism and Reformed, and it's not very logical, but it's just kind of how they work. Uh, but this would be the Reform model. Yeah. So my last slide is this one, and then we can just have a few minutes for, for questions. I haven't really done mention Roman Catholic, but the Roman Catholic tradition is centuries old. You, you have Catholic social doctrine. And a lot of it would sound uh, very much like the other ones. Um, they would talk about the image of God. Um, they would talk about the common good. You see, if, if every human being is made the image of God, we should be obligated to work toward the well-being of every human. And this would be the idea of the common good, which is a foundational uh, Catholic belief. The idea of sphere sovereignty, they would give it a different name, but the concept is, is still there. Uh, what is different about the Roman Catholic Church, again, not in this country so much, uh, because it's been a kind of a marginalized Christian tradition, um, is the idea that because they are the church uh, of God, the true church, that goes back to Peter, the idea is that a true grace comes through the Catholic Church. And so they would have a unique responsibility to speak into and be the conscience of the nation and try to influence and insert, you know, the grace of God uh, in various uh, spheres. This is why, for instance, in the United States, you'll have the, the Catholic bishops will make a pronouncement on nuclear arms. They'll make a pronouncement on, on uh, racism. And so you'll have these different pronouncements uh, at, at the Catholic bishop level, but even internationally, you'll have the, the papal encyclicals. This is their obligation. I remember when we lived in Denver, um, the Catholic bishops the Catholic bishop uh, or archbishop in, in Colorado spoke up against abortion. Well, people up in arms, you know, you know, separation of church and state, you know, why is he even speaking about this? It's none of his business. And I'm going to myself, if you know anything about Roman Catholic social thought, it's his obligation to speak into the public square, you see. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that. But it's grounded in the idea that they are the unique means of grace uh, in the world. Black theology, um, again, you mentioned this a little bit earlier, Herb, is very unique because of its unique history, ambivalent about government for obvious reasons, uh, but very committed, at least historically. Uh, 
black church in the community and black church involved in social issues is kind of a, a natural move, again, uh, historically rooted in this country. And the idea of, of black theology being a prophetic voice, again, this is rooted in their history, in black history. Um, so the idea of social engagement um, by, by clergy is, is a very natural move. And the idea of talking about social things from the pulpit is a natural kind of move. So that, that's the unique kind of contribution to political theology, actually, one of the different options. In liberation theology, there's all kinds now, but in Latin America, largely from the Catholic Church, and kind of distancing, its, distancing itself from, from uh, historic Catholic doctrine, because in Latin America, the Catholic Church back in the day, uh, in many countries, was complicit with the right-wing dictators, and so they were very critical uh, of the hierarchy and, the, and very critical of, of, of the established church. So you begin to see it kind of fraying around the edges, uh, even though they were Roman Catholic, and there would be other models as well. So that's a very, uh, you know, overview at, at 30,000 feet, uh, and we can talk about which one we might prefer. <laughs> Uh, but we probably, consciously or not, have probably bumped into all of these models at some level. So each of them has something to contribute, but at least we need to be aware that there is this variety and, and that some in each tradition's got its weaknesses and its terrible history, even as each tradition has its, its, its contributions to make. So the question is, in light of our Bible studies, which tradition is closer to the biblical witness?